this stock, and I own this stock by the way, this is going back to 2005. The minus signs are obviously losing trades, the green without the minus are winning. What do you notice about the losing trades and what do you notice about the winning trades? Exactly. Winners are big, losers are small, which is always what we taught. And also, do you notice the days in the trade? 146 days, 120 days, 130. What's the going on with the days? We're in a winning trade longer and a losing trade shorter. All right? Stock is Baidu, which a lot of you already own. Now, when I did that, it was at 467. Last night, I think we were at, what, 530, 535. I haven't checked it for the last few days. Baidu is the Google of China. Um, for those that don't know what that is, you can just trade it. I'm not saying this is your first trade, by the way. A $500 or $532 stock is a rich stock. What I used it for is the example of just literally a systematic trade. And this is still on a buy signal. 14 winning trades and we had 24 losing trades and some of you the mathematicians say Vince you could have flipped a coin and done better than that you're absolutely right but our total profit is 64,250 points 38 trades and then 41 days per trade and that if you can go back and check all those dates you'll see exactly what the buys and sells are no RSI, no this, no that, no, 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 no bullshit. Just buy above the line, sell it below. How many people can follow that? Now, you can, you can understand it, can't you? I can understand, I buy above a line and sell below a line. But how many people could do that from 2005 to date and follow it religiously? About 5 to 10% of the crowd can actually follow a system. And those that do? Make good I read money. the book of uh, Jim Rogers and I was looking on the internet um, yeah, for advisors and then I came at the, yeah, the uh, Vince Tanchona's uh, yeah, website and uh, yeah, I, I was just looking to the, the results he made with his investments and uh, yeah, I found it very uh, obvious or because yeah, most other uh, investments you see there are, are yeah, around two till 10 percent and yeah his, uh, were, uh, his investments were very high so and that attracted me to to go to this uh, yeah, seminar I like the way that he um, yeah he only checks it once a day or a week and not uh, he don't sitting behind the but behind his laptop or computer and checking the numbers and he just uh, yeah, looks he do his uh, research and then he put money in it and waits uh, yeah, till it's um, yeah, reaching uh, <laughs> a lot of money, you know, and that's what I, yeah, what I like. I don't, um, yeah, I don't feel I'm a person to to check everything every minute, and because that will, uh, yeah, <laughs> drive my nerves. <laughs> Easy to understand, um, you know. His, I've got his email address, you know. I need to email him about anything. I can do that. He emails you back, so. Thank you very much, Vince, for this very kind introduction, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share some of my views with you today. I started to work on Wall Street in 1970 for an American uh, investment bank called, at that time, White Weld. In 78, they merged with Merrill Lynch, and in 73, they said, we would like you to go to Asia and build up our business in Asia. So I say, well, you know, it's very great hardship to go to Asia and so forth. And then they said, well, you can go for three weeks and then you tell us whether you like it or not. And if you like it, you will build our business in Asia. If you don't like it, then you come back and work in the West. So I went for a day to Tokyo and then for a day to Hong Kong and for two weeks to Pattaya. And then I said to them, yes, I like it. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how I came in 73 to Asia. And then I worked for White Weld until 78, and then for Drexel Burnham until 1990, and since 1990 I have my own business. But the point I wanted to make is in 73, of course, we didn't have mobile phones, we didn't even have fax machines. Walmart was a company with uh, sales of 44 million and uh, 24 stores, and it had just gone public in 1970. And... Uh, 
we were still in the midst of the Vietnam War. In China, Mao Zedong was still alive. And uh, you couldn't invest as a foreigner in China, in India, in uh, South Korea, Taiwan, in Indonesia and China, Vietnam. There were obviously no stock markets. The reason I'm mentioning this is, A, the changes that have occurred over the last 35 to 40 years around the world are really mind-boggling and have exceeded anybody's expectations. I mean, if you go to China today, nobody dreamt 20 years ago to own a car, to travel around, to go to casinos and have own homes and so forth. So all I want to say is we can think about the future, but we will all be surprised how many changes will occur in the next 20 years that may actually alter the world very dramatically. 1989 and 1987, the peso, the Mexican peso, and by the way, also the Argentine peso and the Brazilian real and so forth, they lost 95% of their value. So how do you protect your wealth if you are in a country where the currency goes down, like the US between 2002 and 2007? What happened to asset markets is this. So you have the currency collapses, like goes down like a stone daily. I mean, I went in the 80s to Brazil. You change money every day because if you changed at the beginning of the week, by the end of the week, it was worth substantially less. So in this environment, in local currency, the stock market tends to always go up. So an index of Mexican stocks went from, in local currency, this peso, from 1,000, to a peak in 87 of 343,000 and close at 139,000 because we had the crash. During this period of time, the currency depreciation exceeds the appreciation of stocks. So in an environment where you have central banks printing money, you have to shift your assets from time to time from say, a hard currency, in those days, the dollar compared to the Mexican peso, Argentine peso, and Brazilian real was the hard currency. You have to shift your assets into the hard currency, but at times you have to shift it back into the assets of the weak, uh, weak currency country because they become, in high inflation times, extremely undervalued from time to time. A tough environment, but, but the other observation I would like to make, the people that had cash, Mexican peso here in 79 to 88, because of the currency collapse, they were wiped out. Also the bondholders, they just didn't have any value anymore. But equities protected you more or less, okay? And there are some markets that are inexpensive. Japan, in March 2009, was at the 30 years low, same level like in 81. If the US went to a 30 years low, the S&P would be at 120. At the 20 years low, the US would be at 300 on the S&P. And in Japan, equities have a higher dividend yield than bond yields. By the way, in most Asian markets, the dividend yield on stocks is higher than the bond yield. So you're paid to wait. Here you have Japan. Here it was at essentially 30 years low. Korea and Taiwan were at 20 year lows. Other assets that are. I've been inexpensive. following this for about two years. Generally gets it right most of the time. So yeah, I thought uh, interesting, sort of clears up any. Uh, confusion I thought of before and I think because he doesn't follow the, the mainstream, doesn't go with all the, all, the, all the news articles that are coming out left, right and centre, he sort of looks at the simple way trend, that things are trending, just that sort of general. Although in recent years, you know, as soon as you say commodities, you instantly hear about Jim Rogers, what many of you forget, Mr Rogers has been investing in stocks and bonds and currencies for a long time.